should be able to hear us now i believe right. if if my so settings this are screen, right this is what you can see okay matt might be able to hear us now. can you hear know. us now matt i can okay right. they Perfect. can't see you welcome everyone it's wednesday we are back for another session of live fly tying with the northern angler always trustful always trustful to get these things going when it's live the echo's gone don't worry we fixed it i don't even remember what i clicked I hope everyone but it can works. hear us well. So we're good. Thanks for tuning in. We're Thanks for tuning excited. in. We appreciate it. Uh, this one's a long time in the works. We've been trying to I've get I've been trying to get this guy for a long time. Long time. That's okay. We got him from his from his tying cave, which we all have. I mean Mine's right over there. Brian needs some tying cave inspiration. I, I hope this one will help. Yeah, so I think it will. I'm excited few housekeeping things before we really get started if you haven't done so yet you should hit the subscribe button of course mash that give us a thumbs up that helps us subscribe helps people like. find these videos you're welcome by the way it's free it's stressful for us but we like doing it i mean there's so much good fly tying out there so uh let's see what else do we got going on oh you should sign up for mr jake bellner's introduction to fly tying class happening in february at our shop if you're right, in the area there's just that. a few openings left better hurry he's doing what's he doing hair's ears tomorrow and soft tackles hair's ears think. and soft tackles tomorrow. basics will get you master the basics i don't know we'll ask matt if he jumped right to streamers i don't know i don't see too many hair's ears on his instagram feed so we'll ask <laughs> him about that. what's the smallest fly he's tied last year i wonder that's a good question that's we'll good ask question. him so let's bring in our guest if i can click the right button here there he is we got matt grudewski hey, of adaptive fly uh Thank pretty you. exciting to have him let's see if i can get us in picture in picture i'm hitting all the right buttons tonight this wow. is great so like jam master <laughs> jay with that well, for now, just don't build it up too much. I love it. <laughs> we'll see how far we get with this. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year, Matt. Let's Thanks make sure you, everyone can hear you. Um, let's get your levels up and make sure you're all good to go. So you didn't get the deep freeze we did, did you? We, you know, for here, kind of. I mean, we had a lot of single digit temperatures to where it, I don't, I think we had a couple of days where it didn't hit double digits or it was right around 10. So for us, yeah, that's pretty chilly. Oh, that's about what we had. Yeah, that's about what we had too. We're yeah. spoiled. You know, the, the lake right here insulates us. So we don't, I mean, 10 below or 10 degrees is about as cold, that's as, about we as, cold get, as it so. gets here. Yeah. yeah. Center of the state. We'll probably get a lot of the same, probably about, about the same distance inland. You guys probably a little bit closer. Yeah. A little bit closer. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
for those of, of it's like, like a personal ad, ad for fly tying. Like. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm a Libra. I like love it. That's exactly yeah, that's what we exactly want to hear. What's your favorite color? <laughs> Do you like um, long walks or, on the beach? <laughs> I like long. I like long times in the boat casting for musky. Um, I born and raised in Michigan. Grew up a few blocks from Lake St. Clair, uh, which is kind of where you know my love for musky was originally born. But but all species really um, went to went to college and got Grand Valley in the Grand Rapids area and have just stayed ever since. I mean. I spent a lot of time fishing lakes as a kid, um, you know, Lake St. Clair and a lot, a lot in the Western UP uh, with family and then got very, very, and that was kind of my introduction to trout fishing. I mean, brook trout streams you could jump across and then uh, I got very heavy into trout and steelhead fishing for probably close to 20 years um, before circling back to more lake fishing and the things that I loved about lake fishing and, and musky in general. So that's kind of uh, how I got to where I am. I mean, your, your question about have I tied a hair's ear before? In the not intro, before, just, I've, just. I've tied plenty. I've tied eight flies. Not before, I, will, I, I never question people. <laughs> so, you know. Well, but where the the lake that I live on now, um, I've I've done a lot more pan fishing than I have in years past. So I have definitely tied. I would say the smallest fly I've tied is probably a ten or twelve though still, but um, which is like a midge to me. So they get smaller every year is what I find. Like sixteens are just like microscopic now, I feel like. Yeah, ten I'm years ago, it used to be a normal glass pretty soon. <laughs> right? <laughs> Not so much with a five up. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I have to thank you because uh, personally, I caught a uh, a muskie on one of your flies with Johnny Ray this fall. So thank I you. I heard. That. So I yeah. was in the boat. I just missed you. Yeah. Uh, I was in the boat right after you, so I got to hear all about it, which was cool. Huh. How about that? How about that? Did you hear about Johnny's one cast, one fish? I did. I did. He didn't say a lot I, well, that day I after that him, happened. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> when I sent him that fly, I I was one of the ones. Every year when I send him flies, I put a guarantee on one or two, and that that was that the was one the I one. remember was the highest uh, on the guaranteed list. And he's like, "You won't believe how long it took." <laughs> I think he said two, two or three strips. Yeah, it was like one or yeah. two strips, I think. He was being humble with that. Yeah, it was ridiculous in the best way possible. Yeah. <laughs> so. For sure. For sure. So we, we had a good time, and thanks, thanks for again, for that lucky fly. It's and like for all of you out there, do not fish pink for musky. They hate it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, just... None of that stuff. So <laughs> that's one of my favorite reasons to to go to that particular fishery is most places I fish pink just doesn't work very well. Uh, but in that particular watercolor, it seems to work very well. And every fish I got um, was on was on pink when I was there too. Sure, sure. I so. think last year the fish we got was on pink. The year before might have been pink and chartreuse. So yeah, okay. There's definitely that pink that they they like it really glows out. in that in that color water because like it's dark but clear mm -hmm. um and it, it really it really glows yep all right um so how'd you get uh how'd you get what, what got you the fly fishing bug what was the first thing you said you used to jump across the creeks and all that and right. lake st Clair. can you remember your first fish on a fly uh i can I can remember my first fish on a fly. It was a bluegill in a pond fishing rubber spiders. Um, I remember what got me into fly fishing was, so I was a family of six. I have two brothers and a sister, and my mom fishes as well. So growing up in the Lake St. Clair area, we used to fish St. John's Marsh and Harsons Island, which fish like very, like fish like small shallow lakes. Um, sure. Uh, they're, very, they're very marshy, hence the name. So my dad, you know, we'd fish all day, the four, all six of us in the canoe, my mom and dad's in the seat and the four kids sitting on the bottom or on tackle boxes. And when it would get to be dusk, my dad would break out a fly rod and a popper 
uh, to fish to fish for largemouth, and and he would you know he would hook one and he would let us bring it in, and that was I remember he wouldn't let us do it because that was it would be extremely unsafe uh, with That's all true. the kids. So, uh, but eventually, it'd take us to ponds, or we have um, a cabin in northern Michigan by Mayo and and on a lake, and we do a lot of fly fishing for bluegills. So that was really my first introduction to it. Fantastic. I, I'm very similar. Mm-hmm. Very similar for me. I think it's the Midwest thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, bluegills bluegills on rubber spiders. I mean, it's still tough to beat. That's right. That's right. All right, we're getting a little request for Brian to All right, stay close to your mic. I'll, I'll tune me. you up. All right. Hopefully he gets. Uh, hopefully he wants to back. gesture emphatically. You know, he tries to get. I don't like to get too close to the microphone. You never know where this. <laughs> it's an been. intimate. Well, <laughs> anyway, that's the one you sneezed tonight? on. I know right. it. <laughs> what are we tying tonight? Uh, so I was going to tie a yard sale, and I'll tie it in the kind of the musky musky size, which is will be a little bit easier to see. I think because of what I tie and sell now, I think. Um, the history to this fly is a lot. There's a lot that's not known about it, which is always uh, interesting to talk about. But it started out as a trout fly, and it has you know kind of its origin there. And then with musky, you know, it's figuring out what you can scale up that is still castable, still retrievable, um, and that's how it kind of grew into this size and a very productive fly for musky and pike. Well, any good fly you can build on any scale you want, in my mind. So. I'm excited. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've tied it. I've tied it from two and a half inches up to thirteen, and uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't say how many different species I've caught on it, but it's it's been a lot, and it's it's been a very productive fly for me. Well, fantastic. Take her away. All right. So, like, there's there's one major difference between the trout version and the musky and pike version in that I use a rattle on the musky and pike version, but really the main purpose is a weight. Uh, with with fly fishing, fly tying, everyone has their limits. So if a rattle is out far outside of what your limits are, of what you consider a fly, uh, I usually use lead wire. So usually like 0.35 or something, and and just try to mimic the weight. Uh, that you're going to have in the back and the main purpose of the weight is just to push the fly uh, which is to get it to turn so um, I always use the the example of a trailer with with too much wood in it or it's too heavy and it wants to drive the truck so you have a hinge at the hip and which is what we're going to mimic with the fly and the two hooks and when the fly the front the truck wants to stop the weight in the back wants to push it and it creates, it causes it to turn. So that's what we're trying to mimic. So on the smaller versions, I always use, I just use lead wire. Um, so any anything where really under seven inches, I, I switched the wire. So for this version, the, so the start is a little bit different because of the rattle cre- is so large, it creates kind of an awkward spot on much larger than the hook to, to kind of start your fly. So, and because when you try to tie the rattle right to the hook, sure, it wants it's hard to keep it like stationary. It's it's almost impossible no matter how much glue you use. And I found the best place to place this rattle is right near the bend, like right near the end of the the shank where it starts to bend, because I want that back hook to kind of fight itself. So a lot of what I'm trying to do, especially in musky fishing, is I don't want a fly that swims straight. So if it swims straight, I immediately take it off. Um, so by having this weight on top of the shank, you know, it's forcing that hook to try to fight the weight of it, but it's not enough to turn it over. It's just another thing to sort of break the fly. So it doesn't want to go straight. Um, so to start that process of getting that rattle on, I'll use some bucktail, um, on the larger sizes that use a rattle and I'm just going to lash it down. So I'm just creating a little bit larger platform. Um, and just to get the rattle in, and then you'll see, I'll use a little bit more bucktail to make it easier to get the feathers in. So I do use a little bit of glue just to try to help hold it. And again, this placement I've noticed. So this is a large plastic rattle, and this is what I found to be the ideal way to make the most noise. Like again, 
I don't know if it's increased the number of muskies I've caught, but I highly doubt it's hurt. So in musky fly tying, I always tell people, I see a lot of flies that are overdressed or there's a lot of extra stuff added that isn't a benefit to the fly, but it makes it harder to cast, harder to retrieve. If you can add something to a fly that doesn't make it harder to cast or harder to retrieve, but you like it, because as you guys know in musky fishing, we spend a lot of time staring at the fly coming back to the boat. So if there's something in it that keeps you interested and involved, then do it. Um, you know, it's the same thing with eyes. I don't know if eyes help, but I think they look good and I'm going to stare at my fly a lot. I don't think it's going to deter a fish. So I put it on there and that's with the rattle. I want the weight. I don't, I don't think that the noise negatively affects the fish. If anything, it might help, uh, attract a fish. So I would agree. I always add the rattle on the larger ones. And so I got that rattle kind of lashed down to the bucktail there. And if you guys have any questions too along the way that you want to fire at me, that's totally cool. Um, I always, this is always just a conversation. So, um, how long have you been doing the commercial tie-in thing? Um, let's see now. So, I uh, for those that don't know, and maybe a lot of people do, I got one of these things. All right. So, it was a lot of my the flexibility is, is impressive. It's, Oh, you, when you cut your hamstring and it's not attached to anything, watch this. Oh my god! Wow. Oh my gosh! Yeah. That's so going to go viral. Your- That's going to be some sort of crazy <laughs> meme, I'm sure. <laughs> if you want to increase your flexibility, just detach your hamstring. Um, it does wonders. Um, so a lot of my stuff is pre-leg and post-leg. So it was post losing my leg. So I would say about five, roughly five years. It was kind of when I was home. After coming home from the hospital, uh, I really didn't have anything to do. I was going through withdrawals from painkillers, and it was time flies kind of helped take my mind off the withdrawals. And then, you know, I, for, for a number of years, had people ask if they could buy flies, but it just wasn't something I was interested in getting into. So that was kind of, I guess, with a push to start doing it. So about five years now. I feel like you've really pushed your brand a long ways in five years, though. Yeah, no, oh, no. Appreciate it seems that. a lot longer like, than that. It's, I think you've established an incredibly recognizable brand. I appreciate I mean, that. I, th- I really think anyone anywhere sees one of your flies, they're like, I know who oh, tied yeah. that. Know who tied that. Yeah. And so. I'm a big fan of the eyes, too, by the way, when you said that. And I know Johnny yeah. and Eddie are like, it eh, doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, man. Like, <laughs> I, I have an eye. Give it a target. I got to look <laughs> at something. I started yeah. talking to myself. I don't know about you, like, but when I'm and Matt knows, like, he's been in the boat with me. I oh, started yeah. doing the figure eight, and I'm, I'm just talking to myself, and, and oh, I'm gonna run around the racetrack again, or you know, he just, totally talks whatever. to himself. <laughs> and like every time I've, you know, the past couple of fish that I've got, and it's like, oh, did I just see something? And I'll just like start talking to myself. I'll start talking to the fish. Like there it is, and Matt was just laughing at me so hard. It's. But it is. It's fun. Works it did pay fishing. off, I will say. You have to stay engaged, but those eyes, I like the eyes on your flies because it does help me stay engaged. And I, you know, my fly, so I worked in, in years past uh, as a web designer. So uh, I, I hope that it comes through in my flies, but especially in musky fishing where it's not flies you're typically going to lose. They last a long time. Like I, I don't know if I've ever lost a musky fly to a snag. I don't fish a lot of woody areas though, but I will just, you know, throw them out or give them away before I ever just lose them. So try to put things into it that is in same thing with people that are purchasing them, that it's something that they visually enjoy uh, because they will hopefully have them for many years. I mean, they're, they're not guide flies. They're not, they're not fast and they're not meant to be like just good enough. My hope is that you're buying something that you really just enjoy looking at that also will first and foremost fish very well. And I don't put anything into a fly that's going to negatively affect how it will fish just so it catches fishermen. Like I, I won't do that. So I try to find that, you know, it's not even a balance. I'm first and foremost flies that catch fish then what are more of like an art aspect that I can build into them in the eye. Uh, Did you just turn off the Wi-Fi? Yeah, but we were connected via. Oh. Hold on. All right. I 
I guess I have to turn it back on. Are we connected to the internet is the big question. Did we lose him? Probably. No, we're connected. All right. Hold on. There we go. We're back. Sorry about that, everybody. Oh, internet. What do you mean, error? You're hitting buttons over there. I know. Maybe his internet went down. No, it was ours. I hope we can edit this out for the YouTube channel. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. That was our fault. 100% us. I don't know. Okay. 100% us. All right. Well, let's just jump back into it. (laughs) I don't know (laughs) at what point uh, I lost it, but. so adding the feathers, like, so I, I set, I put in the second round of bucktail, which you can see here are kind of over the top of the rattle and it kind of creates like this wedge shape, you know, oh, so like, that. like this. So now when I, now I have a very easy spot to attach the feathers and it's going to keep them from like going across each other, or kind of collapsing too much, um, which is important to how the fly swims. Um, you know, I really want to create that sort of rudder aspect in the back, which is why I use like a fairly stiff feather. Uh, a lot of times when guys tie yard sales and they reach out to me uh, through Instagram and say, hey, mine just isn't really turning. It just goes straight. What am I doing wrong here? And they send a photo. There's two reasons. Probably the first reason is they're just using too thin of feathers, kind of like your typical hackle feathers that you see for Uh, like your standard bucktail flies, Um, or there's just way too much flash and slinky, which we'll we'll go through that too. A little flash and slinky goes a long way. So it's just sucking up too much of that energy that it doesn't allow that weight to get back or the energy to get back to that weight back here and push that fly. So these, I use a lot of the... Uh, Do you think... uh Fly designers in the future will have uh, physics degrees. I feel like we're headed that direction. <laughs> so I grew up. I grew up. Wa- I really think that this is a big aspect to how I tie flies. I grew up watching Larry Dahlberg as a kid, and he would have those segments in his garage and lure building. And when I first started tying streamers outside of what would now be very small stuff, like your three-inch marabou muddlers and uh, your Madonnas and rattlesnakes, like once I started tying flies that I really wanted to swim in a certain way, those aspects that I feel like I learned from gear fishing or from watching segments from Larry Dahlberg and how to use weight really went a long way. Um, it helps that my older brother, Eric is a, um, is a mechanical engineer and for Ford and knows a fair amount about physics. Um, so I can bounce stuff off of him. Uh, but I do think it goes a long ways and a lot of the best fly, like designers that I know in terms of how flies swim typically have some type of understanding of that, whether intentional or not. Um, but it does make a huge difference, especially I primarily fish lakes, right? Like a fly is, it's harder to create action in still water, but easier to maintain. And then the opposite in rivers, easier to create action with current, harder to maintain a specific consistency. Um, so current- That's a great observation. That's a, you know, that's, yeah, that's a that's big point. I think, um, in terms of flies, like especially predominantly fishermen fish rivers, right? Uh, fly fishermen. So uh, most musky fishermen fish rivers. And I think in some of the like overdressed, really buoyant flies, those could fish well in rivers because of the currents really going to push them around. Uh, but then you take them to lakes and they don't transfer very well. I think if you have a fly that swims very well in a lake, it will always swim well in a river too. Um, but it doesn't always transfer the other way. And that was probably the one of the biggest learning curves of mostly trout fishing, you know, with streamers in the river to transferring it to a lake was I knew right away the flies weren't doing what I wanted them to, but then it was learning what I had to tweak. And then when I took those back to the river for smallmouth and trout, it worked, you know, phenomenally better than the standard stuff I was using before. So physics degree is not a bad idea. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I think it transfers pretty well. Um, so yeah, I use a lot of the whiting, the American rooster, which I think like the 
schlop and feathers you get off these saddles, I think, are the best that you can find that I know of. Uh, if there's better stuff available, that would I'd love to know because these aren't cheap. Um, but the and and you have a variety. Like I use this for all sizes, right? Like the stuff down here, you know, I can use for three, four inch flies, your six, seven inch stuff, you know, all the way up to your bigger stuff here at the top. They're so, just so consistent. They are. That's what's so nice is you can order. buy four of them and they're yes. pretty much going to be the same. Yes, I agree. And so back in the day when you could get good slopping in a bag, as I'm sure you guys remember, that's what I exclusively used. And as that got progressively tougher to find good stuff, um, over the years, I eventually settled on, on the Whiting American Rooster, which, like you said, is super consistent. Um, and so I, I'm going to use, I'll use two on both sides uh, because I want that stiffness. And then, wow. as you guys know, in muskie and pike fishing, you can definitely lose a feather no matter how well you get these things in. If a tooth gets it just right or they're twisting in the net. So if you lose one and you still got three, you're good. But if you started with two and you lose one, the fly is probably not going to swim very well. So I always go with four to make sure that this is really stiff back here. Um, and as you see, like I leave everything on the feather. I don't strip off any of this kind of marabou type stuff because I feel like it gives more for the thread to bind into. Like if you strip it down to the stem, there's just not a lot for it to hold. And when you're talking about musky and pike, you know, you're kind of asking for trouble. So I always go to on a side, you can tie both of them in at the same time, which I often do. If you want to line them up and get them just how you want, you can usually tie both of them in. One of the things I will say, cause this, this is, I try to cover a lot of the frequently asked questions while I do this, but to get the feathers straight and not to roll like you always want to start with some loose wraps like kind of in the beginning and see how it's set up you can still twist it if you want but once you got it where you feel like it's locked in good don't go tight over those wraps and don't work back towards the back of the hook go forward with your tight wraps um, so that you're not twisting or pinching it against the bucktail back here and then just really lash it all down up here then you got them in there pretty solid and pretty tight. And you can see those are, those are in there pretty straight. So what, what thread is that that you're using? So this is UTC 210. So any flat wax thread, uh, that's a little like heavier duty. I've used 280 in a pinch that becomes a little bit much when you're, I'm going to make a lot of thread wraps to lash down the flash and slinky, but I think any synthetic material, something flat, that you can really get in something heavy that you can, you know, I'm going to basically pull this hook down. Um, so you really, really need to bind these materials down. And that's really mostly important with the flash and slinky, not so much with the, with the bucktail. And, and you said uh, that's a, that's a five out hook. It is a five out. So on my standard musky size, this comes out around like nine or 10 inches, depending on, I don't want to create length with the feathers. Cause then I'm just going to create drag and I'm going right. to lose that. Cause I don't want, I see this a lot of times in musky fishing too. And again, it can work flies that just kind of turn right on their spot like this, but they don't travel. Like I want my fly to travel. So I hope you saw that when you fish some of my flies with Johnny is, when you stop, that fly shouldn't just turn. It should at least continue traveling a little bit before it stops, right? A little bit of glide. It that's never hurts. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's what, if you if you create, if I were to extend these feathers out to here, I'm going to lose that because I'm just creating a lot of drag that's going to, you know, suck up energy, stop that fly. So uh, my length usually comes through adding more beads between the hooks uh, and maybe going slightly longer in the feathers, another inch. But when you're talking about the difference between a nine and a 10 inch fly or nothing else in the profiles changing, I don't think that you're changing your bite. So that nine, nine and a half inch, which will be a five odd and a six odd is really like kind of a sweet spot for this fly. If I want something bigger, I'll use a different pattern. Would you say that's about for, I know people are going to watch this later and ask, yeah. is it, I mean, from my perspective, it's about two shank lengths back in terms of yes. how yep. far that That's is about, back. It's it's almost like, yeah, like maybe maybe more like two and a half. Okay. So this is not this is a six up, but it's really only about 
maybe maybe I'll just grab another five eye. It's maybe two eye two eyes longer. Um, the hooks don't have to be red. I just love these hooks, and they're out of black nickel, and so what, I don't think what hook is that? It's the Mustad thirty two six zero eight. So it's like your standard spinnerbait Aberdeen hook. One of the reasons why I really like this, and my buddy Eli uh, Barrett really turned me on to these a long time ago, is they're not a heavy gauge. Like it's so hard to bury that hook to begin with. I've never fought, a, there's not a five out hook that exists that will bend out on a muskie. You know, you're just with a fly rod in the way that they fight, you're, they just don't make one small enough to really bend out. So I want essentially like the lightest gauge five out, six out hook I can get so I can really bury it. Um, most of your predator hooks are going to be pretty heavy gauge. Yeah. Um, which I think is, it just doesn't really help you at all. To, if anything, it hurts you. So if this is like kind of the back of the hook right there, or kind of want, actually, no, you're probably about spot on. You're probably close to maybe even less. So almost more like just under two, okay. two shanks. Um, I mean, it's, I'm right. sure you yeah. don't even, you've tied enough. Well, you know, I don't think about it, right? I mean, it's just yeah. like, yep, that, that's right. <laughs> If I knew they, if they were too long, I would notice you're almost better. You're definitely better off having them too short. Um, as long as they're stiff than you are if they're too long. Um, so yeah, so this, and when I do, I always do the smaller hook in the back. So if I'm doing uh, like standard six inch trout size, you know, a one out and a two out. Um, when I go down to four inch stuff for, for small mouth, uh, like earlier in the year, it's uh, a one and a two, you know, um, so yeah, always, always the smaller hook in the back. There have been times when, uh, especially earlier in the year in the spring where smaller stuff can fish better. I'll use a shorter shank hook instead of like the full length spinnerbait hook. Um, and I always put the shorter shank in the front. I always want to maintain that gap between the hooks. Cause if I put the short shank in the back, that hook points so close to the other bend of the hook. I don't really feel like that back. It closes providing. the gap. It exactly. So I always put the short shank in the front. So I'm just going to add a little bit of flash in the back. I'm a big believer in that you can't have too much flash. I sometimes refer to it as the school of Kevin Feenstra, um, <laughs> where you can't use too much flash. And you can always take flash off your fly when you're out there, but you can't put it back on. But when you're talking about muskies, I, the only thing that I think you can, the only way you can spook a muskie is yourself, boat side, angle of the sun, did something, you know, just there, there are ways that they, they spook from you, but I don't think there's anything you can put into a fly that will spook a muskie. So as long as they can see it, muskies are visual feeders. There's, I think a lot of it stems you from can the always, Like world. you said, you can take stuff out, you know, when you're yes. on the river, Brian likes to take out Johnny Ray's rattles. Um, <laughs> Don't hit them with the motor. It was uh, when you hit the motor. Yeah. 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 So you know how the motor come through on the video. So the, the the large plastic rattles, I settled on those because glass will break when you're, especially when you're throwing a fly this large. When you're putting that much energy into the cast and the stop and start, it'll blow those beads right through the glass. Uh, there's there's no escaping it. Right. Maybe you can cut, you can coat it with a ton of epoxy, but now you're adding unnecessary weight where you don't want. So, anyways, the large these plastic ones, you really got to hit them off a motor, Brian, uh, oh. to break them. But I don't think I have, actually broke it. He was on you about that. He was on me he about was it. But I, I will say, on you about that. It did still rattle afterwards, and he was surprised. It must okay. have been that he had a uh, it must, it right was. hand boat. I think that was the problem. Was that it? <laughs> No. So he has yes. had he has had people in his boat that if you hit the motor hard <laughs> enough will blow out the oh, yeah. metal cap in the back and then the beads come out and you lose the weight and the fly won't swim the same. So uh, not only do these seem to be the ideal weight, they're also the loudest and the most durable. I use some of the brass ones on jig style flies for the weight because the brass ones are heavier. But even those I've had just from catching fish, they get dented and then the rattles, the beads can't move. But these are these are the loudest ones um, and they're the most consistent. They make noise the easiest. So I've always I've always kind of stuck with those and they've, they've worked very well. Um, again, another thing. Uh, 
uh, a buddy of mine who does a lot of gear fishing turned them on to me. I mean, they're jig skirt rattles for bass jigs. Uh, that that's what they are. Um, but they work very, very well. Uh, so those are the ones I stick with. Ideally, yes, don't bounce them off the motors. That's the easiest way to break them. Bounce them off a musky, you know. <laughs> bounce them hey, off a musky. <laughs> it's better than bouncing it off your head. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Don't do that either. Especially with or a five guide. pound, a six pound. Don't hook. hook the guide. Yeah, just don't hook your guide. Pro <laughs> Is this lighting okay or is it too bright? It's fine. It's It looks okay. great. So I tried to use some brighter colors so maybe we can see this a little bit better. Um, but this is where a little flash and slinky goes a long way, and this is going to be the bulk of the fly. This was a material years ago was like when my daughter, was, pro who's now 17, about to be 18, was maybe three or four years old when I would let her pick stuff out at the fly shop. And she grabbed a pack of pink flash and slinky, which at that time I hadn't even, I don't think I'd ever used it for anything. And we were on our regular, like, annual streamer trip with my brothers at our cabin on the Asable. Um, I forgot to bring bucktail, and, like, uh, your double deceivers were, were fishing very well. And I didn't have any, so I was like, what's, the, what's something else I can tie a similar fly? Because we had lost one that was working very well in a certain color. And this was it. So that's kind of how this fly was born, like, at our cabin. And it, I built in a lot of the same aspects that I built into the double deceiver uh, and getting that to swim a certain way. Um, so I basically put all the same aspects into it, but just tried to figure out how to do it with flash and slinky. So I started tying it in as a wing on the top and bottom to try to mimic bucktail. So this is where this stuff, like when it's, I'll just grab the whole thing. You know, when you pull this down, you know, it, when it's in the package, you know, it collapses down. When you take it out, you know, it, it really, it's volume. It really up. Exactly. So it's easy to use too much. So you see, when I pull this tight, that's pretty thin. Um, and that's what I'm going to use on the top and bottom is, is like that width. I like to cut full length, if you can kind of see there. So it's kind of the least amount of waste. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to come in here and put measure this up to the length that I want it, which is right about to the bend of the hook there. And I'm just going to lash it down and I'm going to work back towards the back of the hook, getting like tighter with each wrap to where it doesn't want to move. And then I just come in and cut right behind it. So now at this point, like I haven't wasted anything. I don't need to do any trimming. I typically don't trim anything on these when I'm done. Maybe I just visually, I clean them up. Uh, but you don't really don't even need to. We were talking last gonna, night and I, I told everyone I'm allergic to trimming things afterwards because <laughs> yeah. inevitably it will get messed up and it right. just looks better without it, right. that natural taper. And I think a, the, one of the biggest mistakes people make with that material is trying to fold it like it's laser dub or something. And it, right. it just doesn't fold and you have to have confidence in your wrap, just like what you're doing and trim it off at the mm -hmm. hook and just do one, yeah. one half of that fold almost. It's a stiff material and that's important. Um, you know, flash and slinky, especially, you know, 15 years ago was not an easy material to get your hands on. It was predominantly a saltwater material and, it, and maybe it still is like it's, it's hard to get. You couldn't find stuff online a lot back then. So I've used, you know, FS blend and other synthetics, like when stuff was out and it just doesn't work the same because it's not stiff. So this, because of the volume it holds, the fly is so much lighter than some of the other synthetics that I've used. Like if this were FS blend, I'd have to use twice as much to build the fly the way that I want to build it. And this fly, when it's done and I'll, you know, angle it towards the camera, I can just grab one of these. It's so much thinner than most people think it's going to be when it's done. But especially for guys transitioning from the trout or bass world, when you have marabou and you have rabbit, like everything's going to condense in the water. So you have to build this fly that looks way too big. And then when you fish it, it looks good. This is going to look when I, when you put it on your desk, it's going to look the same as it, it does when it's in the water. So it's not, so it's really easy to make this fly twice as wide as this thinking like that's going to be good and it's just not going to swim well. And it's also going to be worse to, ca to cast. And I think, not just cast, but in musky fishing, guys talk about the casting wearing you out, but you're retrieving the fly way more than you're casting. And I'm sure you guys have known from musky fishing, 
you can switch a fly, whether it gets harder or easier, but there's a noticeable contrast depending on how that fly moves through the water. And some are just like, well, wear you out just from retrieving them. And I think that's kind of an overlooked aspect of musky fishing and, and not getting tired is overdressing your flies. Not only do they not make them fish better, they also wear you out both in the casting and the retrieve. So this fly being thin and the way it needs to kind of cut and glide, it those flat sides like your standard glide bait is what we're shooting for here. I'll just use a contrasting color on the top, you know, again, solid monochrome flies, all white, all yellow, they all work, um, but they're often not the most fun to tie. Uh, so one of the things that's kind of fun about this pattern is you can easily create a top and bottom of different colors. In this light, I'm not sure how well that's coming through, but in honor of you, Brian, I'm going to do mostly pink in the front half of this fly with a white belly. All right. Uh, because I believe that was the color fly, not this pattern, but I think somewhere we have a picture of that. I, don't, I still don't know how to open the Dropbox photos that you sent me, so <laughs> I, I haven't really put, done much with the photos. <laughs> hey, can you open this PDF? Yeah, I kind of expected <laughs> to walk into your house, you know, and have this picture actually right behind us for well, this exact right. yeah. I don't Honestly, guys, I really don't, you know, I don't have any pictures of myself in my house. I'm not that type of guy, I guess. I got pictures of my kids and my family and you know, fish and birds and stuff. I don't, I might have pictures with my kids and I, but yeah. <laughs> None of you yeah. and fish. <laughs> Maybe like in the bookcase, there's one of me and my first tarpon over there. And I think that's, there you, go. you know, something like that, but right. You know, I've, I don't know, just not, not me. <laughs> I, I don't have my, I don't have my college degrees on the wall or anything either. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, some people, yeah. you go in their office and this is all their awards and this and that. And it's like, oh, okay, right. cool. You know? Yeah. I don't, it's just not me. <laughs> I don't have any pictures of me and fish. Now with that said, I have plenty on my phone. You know, I grew up in, my mom always took pictures. My mom has photo albums by year still in her house, starting in like 1977 uh, of photos in, if you went through them, especially as my brothers and I got older, they are 90% fishing and hunting photos with a little bit of sports mixed in. Yep. <laughs> like that that's going to be. I feel like uh, our lives were very parallel there, Matt, because, you know, <laughs> I, I grew up, all, every one of our family vacations revolved yeah. around fishing. And yeah. sometimes both sets of grandparents, aunts, uncles, you know, cousins, that was, you know, we'd go to Canada every all summer. Right for a week or two and mm -hmm. we'd fish, you know, everything from smallmouth perch, lake trout. And, you know, I'd always take my fly rod and, yeah. you know, we, we do lots of different things up there. And then, you know, my grandparents had a lake cottage. So that was always the bass bluegill extravaganza every weekend for me. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, like Florida and the, you know, my grandparents lived in Florida. So, uh, you know, they had a place that attached to Sarasota Bay and we could, just we had a little boat and we could go out and fish and catch everything from trout to sheephead and so right. all of our family pictures are that way too it's, it's yeah like, you know everybody's you holding fish. Like, yeah when you say your vacations i like i i am sure it wasn't this late but i feel like i was in high school before i realized people took vacations that weren't centered around hunting and fishing like right. i had a buddy say oh we're going on vacation i'm like oh where are you going fishing and he's like oh we're going to you know myrtle beach and i'm like to do what just sit around but that, that's a vacation. <laughs> uh, so it, uh, that was definitely my family as well. Every, every free time, any minute of free time we had away from sports, like that's what we were doing. Right. So, right. Which I fully appreciate as an adult. Um, you know, the sacrifices that my parents made for us to be able to do that stuff was, was definitely worth it. As much as I wanted a pair of Jordans when I was in sixth grade, we had a cabin up north that we could fish in the backyard and, you know, a place to hunt, you know, five minutes away and the Asabo River, 15 minutes away, like kind of tough to complain about not having Jordans. That's heaven right there, right? Yeah, you know? yeah it really and, is. and we realize it later. And, yes. the, and the crazy thing is, you know, unfortunately kids today, you know, even that their parents want to introduce them to the outdoors, hunting, fishing, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I mean, we had beagles um, and I was, I was, you know, played sports every season. Right. You know, you played right. baseball, you put ran track, I ran, you know, played football and I, I wrestled. So, but we didn't have those events. 
seven days a week and we didn't have a tournament every weekend yes. and the parents didn't have to travel and do all yep. that. And I, I feel like, gosh, you know, these kids that, that do this, they miss out on growing up in the outdoors, even yep. if they're in an outdoor family, their time right. is so limited free time, yes. you know, that it's, it's difficult to drag them away from their friends at that point, you know? Right. And I know if my, my son plays lacrosse, um, he plays soccer as well, but he's heavily involved in the outdoors, but it, lacrosse especially is, you know, predominantly, uh, still the best competition is on the East coast. And from January to the end of July, you know, we're going out to the East coast three, four times a week, uh, to play in the best club program he can play in. It's an hour and a half drive one way to practices, you know, a right. couple times a week in the summer. Uh, that was one of, I mean, one of the things that we've been lucky to live, we moved, we live on a lake now. So literally he can just walk out the backyard and fish. Um, fortunate to have a hunting property 10 minutes away, uh, that someone is generous enough to let us, to let us use. Um, but without, without that stuff, like when we were kids, we had to drive, especially in the St. Clair Shores area, you know, we had sure. to drive two hours to do any of that outside of fishing Lake St. Clair, but or to travel to fish, to hunt. But yeah. Right. And for us, like as, as a big whitetail family, there was no time to duck hunt in the fall. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we had a family of six and my parents didn't buy meat, you know, right. fish, squirrels, rabbits, whitetails, you know, we're, we're a family, we're going through 10 deer a year. So like there was a, <laughs> there was no, ducks don't have enough meat on them. I get <laughs> the only it. reason why we squirrel hunted is because I was open before whitetails. <laughs> <laughs> And rat, rabbits, rabbits stayed open after January 1st, so right. we shot rabbits, you know? You could shoot uh, rabbits until March 15th, I that's think. That's right, that's right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, I hear you on the sports. It is crazy how much more involved it is now than it used to be, and the coaches expect that, and if you don't do it, even if your talent is there, if you're still not out there all the time being seen, um, other kids look like they're putting in more work. Uh, it's Absolutely. Tough. No, it's, it's tough. tough. And, 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 you know, my kids went through that with skiing and whatnot, so I could totally relate. Yeah. And it was, it was difficult to get them into, you know, even to spend any time in the outdoors. And once yeah. they did, they loved it. But, sure. um, you know, it just, it is what it is. So back right to the sorry. Yeah, play, let's tie some glass. <laughs> we could talk about this. We we'll have a whole other podcast. Right. Uh, <laughs> So kind of similar to, so I don't have to do any trimming. I'm kind of lining up this body and it might actually be easier to see if I'm not in front of it so that I don't have to trim and I'm building that shape. So I kind of tease out and I've already done it on this one where these are going to be at an angle uh, so that when I tie this in, it doesn't need to be trimmed. I'm just going to line it up exactly to start to see the shape that I want. And I'm going to lash that down again. And again, make sure you get that thing on there tight so it doesn't want to slip out. Um, and so on the back hook, I'm just going to do, and this is pretty standard no matter on what size. It's usually like two rounds on the back hook. Depending on the size of the fly, we'll do four rounds on the front one because, as you can see, by the time we were done tying in our feathers, we were halfway up the shank. Obviously, we're going to put a head on the front one, but we don't need as much room, but we have that full shank to still build the body. Same thing with the trout stuff. It might be three rounds on the front hook, but it always usually works out to two on the back. Again, I like to add a little bit of flash and just by the way that this fly swims and it likes to go side to side, I like to try to put the flash right on the side of the body as I think it gives it the most benefit versus like over the top, especially the way, you know, your standard steelhead and trout stuff, a lot of times the flash is tied over the top, but the way that muskies will approach a fly and the same thing with pike i feel like the lateral flash and i'm not a big realism guy i'm action is number one far and away from realism this ends up having a relatively fishy shape when it's done um and i'm going to put this flash on the side and when a you know a fish typically that's where its most reflective scales are going to be and where you're going to see that flash but uh, i'm not concerned with realism uh, you, the things that muskies will eat, I don't know, you know, on the gear side, like a, like a bulldog, a big rubber bait with a long curly tail. I don't know if that's ever replicated in the wild, uh, but muskies eat the shit out of those. So I'm not too concerned with realism, especially when it comes to 
when I'm looking for a predatory instinct, whether it's a large bass or a trout, you know, a 24 inch trout or a pike or a musky, or a pike or a musky, it's the action um, that they're looking for. Then the last thing I'm going to do on this hook is I'll do like a craft for a wing over the top. This was something back in the trout days when I was fishing this, I forgot to put that on one time in the early years of making this fly and it didn't swim the same. And I didn't, I noticed it wasn't swimming as well. So I took it off and put a different one on. And it wasn't until later that I was trying to figure out what did I do wrong on that one. It was the only thing that was missing was the craft or wing hmm. on a smaller fly. You know, maybe it makes a difference in terms of like how the fly is going to swim and keeling that fly, having that wing over the top. But if, at the very least, it allows another place that you can put a different color in. So, you know, in this case, I'm going to put like this, this uh, dark pink, this fuchsia color over the top, which is really going to pop. And yeah, it's just it really a, does pop. Uh, a little, a little different color. Um, to the fly and if you if you are into realism in terms of a fly and which is totally fine you know this is a great way like fish typically have a darker back so this allows you a way to add that darker color over the top if you want this i do reverse tie and the reason why i do that is it's a little bit cleaner and i want to make sure this stays kind of as a wing over the top and not get kind of you know pushed down as i'm lashing it down so i do reverse tie this but don't reverse tie the flash and slinky that's going to be a nightmare as you mentioned earlier because the material's uh, so stiff just going to add a little bit of glue because on the heavier thread i don't even bother whip finishing just a quick half hitch in the glue and that's never going to come apart if you do want to whip finish I've never owned a whip finish tool. Maybe I'm old school, but you can do it real quick with your fingers like that if you feel a little bit better about finishing it off. But this is pretty heavy thread, so um, whip finishing sometimes just becomes a little bit bulkier and a little bit harder to get tight. So a little bit of glue and you're good. So that's going to be the back half of our fly. What flash are you using, Matt? I'm using Polar Flash. Now, Flashaboo is okay. fine. Polar Flash is a little bit stiffer and not just stiffer. You get two different types weird. of fibers in there. You get a twisted yeah. and a straight fiber in there, which is nice. Yeah. Don't try and comb it. Right. And <laughs> but it looks really weird. good. It's weird because it's like I, I refer to it as stiffer, and I don't know if that's the best way, but it always lays flat where Flashaboo a lot of times, even sometimes I get it out of the package and it's kind of crinkled. And again, and probably it falls. doesn't matter at all but it, it when it terms of like a side flash you have a lot of really great colors like any of the pearls your golds your coppers like uh the the olive which i use a lot of times with chartreuse is um i i've used flashaboo and you, you definitely can there's more consistency in polar flash in what you're getting versus how it's going to lay on the fly well and i think but, for a for a side application you get a little bit of that almost scaled look you know not yes. maybe not full-on lateral scale but kind of yeah. a mix of the mix of colors you know and the yes. mix of light reflection properties yeah. so in the lateral scale is awesome too that that stuff that stuff's awesome it, it uh honestly like if it were if you got as many strands for the same price i would probably use lateral scale all the time but you don't uh, but that stuff, that stuff's great, especially over anything dark, like over black or something. That's that just it really, really does really pop. pops in the water. Yeah. And that's where, like, muskies again, like yeah. they're vi they're visual. Muskies are visual feeders. I think from the gear world side, when you're talking about huge blades and big rubber baits and pushing water, it's this sense. And they do have a lateral line, but it's just to accurately strike. It's not so much in fish detection. Is guys focus so heavily on this? push water and attract fish and they're taking away some like uh, action or castability uh, purposes of their fly to try to push water and it's not providing the benefit that they want. So muskies are so visual. Um, so like you said, any flash, like I'm going to, the muskie's going to be able, depending on the water clarity, see your fly from much further away than it could ever feel it. Um, you know, muskies in general, According to the science, I'm not a biologist. They can feel roughly the length or a length and make, you know, roughly the length of their body. So a 40 inch muskie can feel 40 inches away. The chances are it, it, know, it can see your fly 
within 40 inches, you know, unless it's facing upstream in a river and you cast behind it, that might help, right. but it's not. And granted your flies leaving a radius in the water. So let's say that's two feet. So now you're adding two feet, 24 inches on top of that 40 inches. But again, uh, muskies are very, very visual feeders. So anything you can do, and that's where I think eyes sometimes, uh, you know, I've fished in low light conditions when my fly is coming back to the boat and it turns, that reflection from the eye is the first thing I can see. And I'm not a fish and I know we don't see the same, but anything that's sending a reflection or vibration in terms of a rattle, um, the science says aids in muskies detecting your fly much more so than feeling it. Um, and I think that it's just, that's just a really, really misunderstood aspect of muskie fishing that would save a lot of guys energy and materials, uh, when they're tying and also equal the same amount or more fish. Um, but that's kind of off on my tangent. Um, so yes, anything that attracts a muskie visually, I'm all for Perfect. Now, when you're talking about size, you know, you're talking about double 10 Colorado blades and a 16 ounce rubber bait ripped through the water. Now you're talking about creating a large radius that, yeah, maybe a muskie could feel. It's why those baits work better when visibility is under a foot compared to a fly. I just don't think you can mimic that with a fly. If you can, I don't know if you can cast it, although water, <laughs> water. In, in the the new trend of water loading, maybe you could. I think we're going to see guys casting pounders on fly rods in the near future. Oh, I don't uh, know, man. Those new echo <laughs> rods really cast well. Hey, we did have a question here while you're tying yeah. that up. Is uh, how many hours a day are you tying flies for orders? I mean, it varies. Like I would say, probably at the high end, maybe four hours a day. You know. Um, I That's try about all to you can do. Yeah. And it's it's always important for me to not get to the point of feeling like I don't want to do it. I have got to where I don't take orders anymore. I just put stuff on my website. So that that kind of helps because I when I get orders, I have this strong urgency to get them out to people as quickly as possible. And I usually always promise like two weeks. So I always try to keep my orders down to get people stuff when they order it. Um, which is just a personal preference of myself. Uh, so now I've just switched to putting them on the website. So this time of year when things are a little bit slower in the winter, uh, in terms of people buying flies, I'm able to get a little bit more inventory on the site. But yeah, four or five hours, anything more than that, like just gets uncomfortable. I would agree. And if you want to buy flies from Matt, the link to his website is actually in the description of this video. It's adaptivefly.com. Uh, and it is visually stimulating and full of a lot of fun, good color inspiration. Really, really good flies to look at, and there's the vi the photos are awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Another like kind of the web design background. <laughs> right. um, if I'm gonna build something, uh, I want to make sure, like from my, uh, I'm my own, I'm my own web development client, so. Uh, it's, that makes it a little bit easier, but yes, I want to just, so I talked about kind of like, I want you to buy a fly that you, when you open the package or you just want to look at it and that kind of starts with the website. So I do take a lot of pride in that. So I appreciate it for the connection. Like this needs to be stiff too. Uh, and I don't know how well it is to see, it's probably almost impossible to see the loop over that hook. So that's a really, really important aspect for me. I see a lot of times where there's a big loop around that rear hook and you're just increasing the chances of that fly following up especially when you talk about muskies they push so much water when they come at the fly and sometimes they miss i mean when they uh their mouth opens they're blind for that period of time until the mouth closes i mean that is that is the function of the lateral line to uh, to attack their prey at the appropriate distance to strike accurately so they do miss, and I have seen flies ball up uh, from the just the hydraulics of the water, and then that game's over. You see that with trout too, the way they slash at it, you know. And as soon as that fly is fouled up, that's it; it's over. So that's important outside of like casting. We all know in musky fishing, it's easy any streamer fishing long days to get lazy with the cast and make a poor cast and foul up your fly. 
So I try to reduce that fouling up. And also I want that hinge aspect that I talked about so that the fly, the only way it really wants to turn is left and right. You know, I don't want it going a bunch of different directions because I want the head to turn. And once that does and the energy of the weight in the back pushes it, now my fly line is pointed back this way. So the next strip has to pull it back the other way. And that's how you start that side to side action and maintain it. So I don't, I want that to basically just create a hinge. And so to do that, this needs to be stiff. So this is 65 pound coated wire, um, which is pretty stiff stuff, um, plenty strong enough. And then I, and also like, I don't use shanks to connect. Uh, that is a very bulletproof way to never have it break, but it's hard to- If you tie them incorrectly. Like, right. <laughs> Right. If you time it's all about who's that, using it, <laughs> right? Um, but it's hard to. I want this loop just barely big enough for the hook to move, right? So if if I were to go too tight and it can't move, take off a couple of wraps. If this is too big, I I want it to barely be able to swing left and right. That's hard with the size of the loop on a shank. That's a little bit hard to mimic, uh, to where you have you have less control over it. Um, with what I want to accomplish with the flies I tie. I think shanks are a great way to do a lot of other things you want to accomplish, and they are very bulletproof. Um, I haven't had one break on a fish. I will say this. I know Eric has, but that fly was in the upper 20s of the number of fish that it had hooked. So I personally haven't hooked 27 fish on a fly. So wow. <laughs> if you are, if you're hooking 20-something fish on a fly, maybe avoid the 65 pound wire. I think I would retire it after yeah, one. I think if you, if you hang, yeah, exactly what I was going to say. If you catch <laughs> 25, you should frame it and maybe yeah. put it in on the right. wall at that point. Now that's, that's, that's clients and Eric, like, right. It was a fly that was working well. So a lot of people fishing it a lot of days in a row. Um, but I haven't got to the point to where the, where it was able to break. I also get bored easily. So like you said, if I've caught a I probably have very, very few flies that have caught double digit muskies on before I was bored with it and on to something else. So. Sure. That makes sense. So um, one of the things like you were talking about the glide as you tie this in, um, in the, in the movement of the fly, what I noticed when I was fishing the flies that you had tied the, the glide, I bet that, that fly with the retrieve and we were using a 450 grain, you know, sonar line. Mm -hmm. Um, but I bet it was moving a foot either way, maybe yeah. more. Yeah. Um, if you gave it that pause, like you had right. to fish it, right? You watched, you know, yes. your retrieve ratio. But if you let that glide in, it was amazing the amount of movement that these flies have. I think that you get more movement out of the flies many times than you do um, some of the other, like, conventional tackle musky uh, baits. And I, that's that's good to hear because it's not everyone's going to be perfect and like there may be you know what i would call some duds along the way where it only moves like a foot or something but that is ideally minimum of a foot is what i would like how far that fly to travel you know closer to two feet and more is certainly possible and all of that i think just aids in in triggering that musky sure um, and i was fun. probably being very conservative saying it was moving a foot because probably some some of our viewers and listeners are like oh yeah right like it wouldn't move more than six inches it was yeah. it was definitely moving more than a foot but yeah. you know it's it's and that's where fishing. like uh yeah well and and fish it right like you said um you have to you have to pause for the fly to travel and um it's not often slow like even like when i was fishing with johnny and ed like um ed said you're fishing slower than i am and i was like but our flies are getting back to the boat at the same time so it was it looks like i'm moving slower but my strips are longer so putting all that energy into the fly and pulling it far enough and then by the time i get back to my line to pull again that's my pause i'm not i'm never waiting it's like i'm always moving but the the time it takes to get back is where that pause comes into play it's 
So again, I'm going to do four rounds. And again, like, I don't know. So this was, this was my waist on that first round of flash and slinky that I cut off. And that's where for me, when I first started using this stuff, um, I'm fortunate to get materials in the way that I'm able to get them now. But at that time, I didn't want to waste anything. So um, this is a way I found to to not not only not have to trim the fly, but also to waste the least amount of material. So again, I'm gonna I need to cut off another full length to kind of start over here again. Since we ran out of that one. And I'm gonna tease it out so we kind of create that taper. Are you guys good on your end? We are. We're a little bit worried about Matt's computer okay. battery at this point. It's plugged in. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant, at first I thought you meant mine. I was like, no, I plugged it in no, for no. that reason. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's not confusing, great. is it? Right. <laughs> Sorry. You want me to, do you want me to hustle through this a little bit more? Oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. There's so much good knowledge here. Often, it's, it's helpful. I have a tendency to talk about fly design and fly action and musky behavior more so than I'm tying the fly. Well, it's fun to talk about. I mean, that's, that's the why we spend so much time on these flies, right? I mean, we did right. have, while you're tying, I'm going to talk a little bit about that flash yeah. slinky. We did have a question from uh, Chris, one of our customers about the difference between that material and something like EP fibers. And if you were yeah. con to compare flash and slinky to EP fibers, Flash and Slinky much stiffer and is kind of like uh, super hair. If you've ever felt that it's, it's very synthetic. I mean, with some flash kind of scaled flash built into it. Whereas that EP mm -hmm. fiber is much easier to compress. So mm -hmm. what Matt's talking about here is really important about really covering all the butt sections with tight wraps because yep. you don't have the ability to compress in a small area. So he's talking about, covering those butts, you know, kind of in a larger section of that shank. And that's yeah. pivotal to having things not pull out when you hook a fish or when you cast it or when your friend tugs right. on it, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> and flash and slinky has that kind of crimpness to it. So that's where I think is where a little goes a long way As you can, there's, I don't know how well you can see, but there's, there's a good half inch between the sections uh, because, you know, and when this lays down, you can't see a gap in the sections. Like that's, you know, how much volume that, that material takes up. And like I said, the, the, EP, the EP fibers I've seen are a little bit flatter and they, I don't think they're designed for a fly this large, which I really know material probably was. Uh, this one just transferred the best. Um, but I wouldn't use this as a tail material. So I'm sure it might have been the fly that you were using, Brian. It had a synthetic tail. That's a different material. Like I, years ago, I tried to use Flash and Slinky, and it's way too much um, off the back of that hook where it just creates so much drag that the fly, the fly can't glide. Um, so, but for this purpose of almost like substituting bucktail, it works very well. That's... Yeah, I think I, mine was synthetic. Yeah, we so you were probably using the slip and slide, which uh, what I use on that one. You can use SF Blend on that one. Uh, my favorite one is the the Sinyak, um blend that, that Eli puts together, which you can get on his site, which I think is greatlakesfly.com. Um, I, yep. I, I have bags of that stuff. That is great tail material. It is for the amount of volume it uses, it's so little material, especially like if you tie it in over some type of like a dam of like bucktail, you know, it just holds it open and then tapers down uh, where you can use such a little amount of that material. So I was gonna tie in a little bit more polar flash on the side. I just like to take like twice as much as I think I need and tie it in on one side and then just pull it around the other side of the hook and tie it down so just reducing the, the odds of it coming out and it's from a time standpoint is a little bit easier and then i'll do the craft for wing again 
while you're so tying just, that crafter in, yep. we did have a question about your tie-in points for the Flash and Slinky. Are you mm-hmm. staggering them as you work up the shank, or are your top and bottom tied in at the same point? Same point. Top and okay. bottom are side in, tied in at the same point. And that allows me to kind of just finish off at the same point, whether it's the eye of the hook on the back one or where I want to build the head on the front one. And I think, too, the same point just allows you whether you tie. So I, because of the way that I tie the material and clip after it, I'm doing like two on the top and then rotating two on the bottom. And, you know, I'm always catching up the other way that it uh, kind of doubles the wraps over the other section that's already tied in. On the crafter, I don't pull out a ton of the kind of, I mean, it's a synthetic material, but there's like under hair. You, you pull under, out that you know. under fur. Yeah, just a little bit of it because I still want some of the like, uh, so I want it to kind of push against itself a little bit when I lash it down so that it doesn't want to collapse too much. It kind like of just stays. my small mouth flies, I don't really take that under fur out because I want that yeah. to build up, right? Exactly. So now at the base there, I have just a little bit stronger base that kind of helps it just kind of hold it over. So now I'm to the point to where I can build my head. And this is one like if you've tied glow bugs before. So if you live in the Midwest, you probably have. Uh, It's kind of like tying two glow bugs that we're not going to trim. So I'm going to tie, I'll do two colors again, but I'll do top and bottom. And with I use laser dub. Some of the other dubbing materials I've used are a little bit longer than I like, or they hold more water. Some of the larger like predator dubbings, uh, when I was up fishing with, with Johnny and Ed, they had some and day two would tie to fly. And I used some of that stuff and it was noticeably heavier. Like when casting it, it fished, it felt like it fished pretty much the same, uh, but it was noticeable difference when casting it. Uh, especially like on like that slip and slide, it has a larger head, so it was more material. But with laser dub, it's best to kind of tease it out and then bring it back together. So you're kind of getting the center of the materials because they're not all the same length in the same spot. So like I do that a few times till I kind of have, I feel like I have mostly the center of the materials there. So when I tie it in, because I am going to brush this out, it doesn't pull out a ton of the fiber. So right in the middle, kind of like our glow bug there. So I am going to do two rounds on the top and bottom. And that's like one of the things when I have people tell me that they can't get their heads to quite look the same. I think they're using two clumps that have a much more material. So it's a little bit harder to shape. So I'm going to do, I'll tie in the top, right? Again, just lash it down in the center and then pull it back and then just wrap in front of it. And so that's kind of the first round and then I'll do one more. And that that kind of give, that gives me the head shape that I'm looking for on this fly. I think anytime you're trying to do like a, more of like what would look like a standard shape of the front of a fish, doing multiple rounds of less, um, Dubbing material makes it a little bit easier to shape versus doing too heavier clumps. It's probably the same way, you know, like the concept when you're stacking deer hair or, or something like that, you know, you're better off right. taking those smaller clumps and, and packing them tightly. Yeah. So same with this material, I would say. Right. And this is where like too, if you want, like a lot of my flies again for the visual aspect, uh, where you see like the red throats or the orange throats, like if I were to do orange or white over this and then brush it out, it gives like a nice gradient of color. Again, the fish, I'm sure, don't care. But if you want to tie one that when you go to pick it out of the box, you're like, this is the one, that's how I that's how I get that color. That's how you guarantee them, I see. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a question about just materials yeah. in general. I think I think Joe's uh, referring to the flash and slinky on the front hook, do you go any thicker than you would on the back hook? I, I don't. I don't. There is just going to be less in general, is right. We did like two rounds on the back, but because of the front, because we're not starting with building up that tail section, there's four on the front. So it ends up being twice as many, but there's not an increased volume 
uh, or the width. When this, if if you were to see this fly in person because of the lack, because there's half the amount of synthetics on the back before building into the feathers, it's gonna allow this to move much freer compared to the front. And we have this dubbing head, um, so it does. But I don't, I don't, one of the things I, um, that I get asked too is if I do it, if it's wider on the top than the bottom, it's not. If that's how it ends up, that's okay, but you don't want it the reverse way. You don't want more right. material on the bottom than you do the top. If you end up with a little bit, if you want just always error on the side of having a little bit more on the top than the bottom, um, but if it's equal, that's what I'm typically shooting for. So oh, once I have good. that tied in, I'm going to use, I, this brush works the that best. thing is awesome. Use, isn't it? I, yeah. A friend of mine gave me one of these. He got at a craft store. Like it, it may, I was probably close to 20 years ago. Um, I think it's supposed to like go on your finger or something. <laughs> it never works on the finger. Um, hairline sells it as a finger dubbing brush. I, Is that what it's called? It's, okay. It's totally uncomfortable to stick on your finger. And, and <laughs> it's like a small section of, you know, the old school dog, dog cat brush. brush. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it works and awesome. What you want, it doesn't have to be this brush, but the these need to be long. It's got to get in there. So like if these teeth or whatever they're called are short, you can't really get in there and get out the trapped fibers. So this, anything that's long and not too tight, there's kind of some spaces between these. But I'm just going to brush this out. And because we kind of lined up the, the fibers, we definitely end up with some in the brush, but if you didn't line those up, you'd have twice as much and your head would be half the size when you brushed it out. But you can see how it kind of blended that shape into the fly, which again, going back to physics, like having that kind of flow of water, we want it to be able to glide and move easily through the water. We're kind of getting there. And uh, Laser Dove is a great material. I'm sure a lot of dubbings, if you want to color it, you'll see a lot of my flies. Uh, the Prisma color markers are awesome for that. I have way more than an adult should probably own that's not an artist. Um, and <laughs> well, you can you color them in any way that you want. You can darken the head. You can add a bloody throat, um, whatever you want to do. So then the last thing I'm going to do is add eyes. And I use pretty large eyes because if I'm going to put them on there, I want them to either reflect light or be seen. Hold on, my dog really wants to go out. Oh, we can hear him. That's okay. No worries. We can fill time. Brian's playing with the cat that we never see. Cider. Oh, my. She's like, just scratch his face. <laughs> we never see this cat. It looks pissed. <laughs> So I'm going to ask a question for Joe that yeah. he hasn't even asked yet because I know he's just like churning at home wondering about this. What is your um, observations and difference between a standard Sharpie marker and the mm -hmm. color uh, specific, I believe they're Prisma markers. Is that, am I saying that right? Yes. I know I get yeah. them at Michael's. Prisma. I don't know. Yep. I know I my wife they... has dozens <laughs> <laughs> yeah pr yeah prisma color so the nailed it yes. in my experience these hold up way longer really than okay. your standard sharpies i used to use sharpies and then i would buy myself you know every couple times i fish the fly of having to recolor them these can certainly fade over time too but i've found they they last that they last longer they are a little bit more expensive that's for sure i think they're six seven dollars a marker um but for for me and the amount of flies that, that i color and again if if it were just me i could handle having to recolor a fly with a sharpie but if someone's buying a fly from me the last thing i want is for them to fish it once and lose its color so um the prisma color ones definitely last longer in my experience copic is the other brand i was thinking of and and joe's okay eagerly chipped in there one of those times we're gonna have him sitting in between us he's gonna be so excited Joe, it'll be a lot of fun i'm excited to have him so right on uh what so size for, eyes are you tying with yeah so these are these are half inch so i think that's 11 millimeter if i remember right um i like an eye that has the foil back because it reflects it just reflects more light so if i'm gonna put a 
again, I don't know if the eyes help or not, but I think one of the strongest benefits that I feel like they have, again, that's not based on anything, is they will they'll reflect more light. Like it, just another thing, again, talking about mis- muskies being a visual feeder, just one more thing to maybe attract, you know, catch their eye of what was that and go investigate. So uh, all the eyes I use and all the varying colors uh, are typically a foil back. Um, and again, they're all, you know, I like the larger size, like half inch. You can use a smaller eye and I have in years past, I don't know that it, you know, it went to any more fish. The larger eyes, again, just cosmetically, I feel like they look a little bit better. I don't think based on this fly is attached to wire. And then shortly after that is an actual fly line and there's hooks and there's beads that the muskie's gonna investigate and be like, wait a minute, those aren't the right size eyes for a fish like that. Like I'm out. I That's know, but we just, uh, but it would drive me nuts. Just like the tails being slightly too long, if the eyes were just slightly too <laughs> yeah. big, or too, it's all about I'm, scale. And I like big eyes because I think it gives them a target, and it's probably the whole Larry Dahlberg thing, sure. you know, that predator yeah. thing that right. I grew up in. That, the other yeah, issue with the too small eyes like is that. you're trying to sculpt a shape, a vertical shape out of that head. And yes. if, if you're using too small eyes, you're not able to hold as much structure in in my mind to get that turn. I, and maybe yeah. I'm, yeah, I don't want to jump in. This is your, you know. No, no, you're spot on. Like you can control the shape of that head and the stiffness of that head. Like even on some of my other flies, I might have some laying around. So like on this fly, which has a larger head, um, those eyes and the glue that I use, like it's relatively stiff here. So that material is not going to collapse as much by having those eyes on there. Any any gel type glue, I you know I don't know if there's one specific that works better than another, but it needs to be gel uh, so that the materials don't soak it up. You know it should take it should take at least several minutes to cure on its own, um, but it needs to be gel. If you use like a standard super glue, the materials just soak it right up and it's not going to hold. So. Um, I've you, used a variety. Are you willing to of share different... your your industry yeah. secret glue there? So this is I don't this is a B seven thousand. Oh, um, yeah. I've used a variety of of it. Just I look for maximum strength in gel. Those are the two things I'm looking for. Um, I've even used uh, like they for years. I used it was like a shoe repair glue. Oh, uh, that Should was a be. gel that worked very well, but it gets you really, really high. So, um, <laughs> if that's what you're going for, that's your glue. I think it was called like shoe goo or something like that. It was but if you're it's definitely shoe goo. Gear, we all own it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Russ and I used to tie with shoe goo and that soft tech stuff. Hi. Yeah. Remember the soft tech? I believe. Russ, I believe. Russ we, our cabin or like room would stink <laughs> so badly. Yeah. So. This one is fairly strong too. There was like a scotch one that I've used that works really well. And it's, um, uh, it doesn't smell quite as strong, but again, I kind of just use what's available. This stuff works pretty good. Um, you know, multi-purpose, like typically if you find ones, like any type of fabric glue works well, cause it's meant to get wet. Like you're going to, you know, you'd put it Wash in the washer. It. Yeah. So those are, you know, those can be really good. Um, I'm currently again, I, a huge fan of, uh, and I just lost it. Yep. Man, that's awesome. I have it on my desk. Um, <laughs> liquid fusion. Ooh, liquid okay. Fusion. It's a slower that cure is. time. It's like an overnight thing, but man, it's gotcha. suction cups and it's a flexible. I find like some of those super glues are brittle. You know, if you sure. use like a, and one fish pop, there it goes. And it's just, yeah. And I think, I, I mean, this could be, we could talk about glues for eyes for an, an hour episode, I think. So I'll just, I'll cut myself off. <laughs> so yeah, we had one think, question here. Um, do you yeah. ever place any foam under the head to keep uh, the front from diving after the glide? Yeah. Yeah. So I do. Um, I don't sell any like that because when you talk about like time and materials and, um, but um, because I use a, because I use a snap uh, to connect my flies, um, 
without using the snap, you don't have as much weight up here. You can get away without it. This, these will still fish well, but if I'm ever in a situation where I want to fly, I want it to let it hover a little bit more before it drops, um, I will add foam. Uh, a lot of times where I do it is on like my largemouth stuff. So if I were to tie these, the yard sails I tie for largemouth, where sometimes I really just want to let them just sit there after they glide, uh, I use I use a lot of foam on those. And and usually what I do is is I don't use the popper heads because I don't want the bulk of it. What I do is I just take like your standard hopper foam and I just tie it around the shank or I tie it in as like um, almost like a wing between sections. So just lash it down, let it stay up at like a 45 degree angle, you know, so it's not pushing the that flash. Fettuccine foam might be a perfect, right. perfect yeah. thing Have you played for that. with yeah. that fettuccine foam? Yeah. I haven't. I haven't. So that, yeah, that could be a, that could be a really good option as well. That's, um, that was probably one of my favorite smallmouth flies the past year. Building heads out of that is just, well, you I, get that buoyant. Let's check it out. Yeah. We'll play with that. And with, with musky, a lot of times I'm not going to let it sit there that long. Like when it glides, if they haven't eaten it, I want to take it away again. So versus as you guys know, with bass, both large mouth and small mouth, sometimes you can leave it there for, you can leave it there for 15, 20 seconds before they just can't take it anymore and they eat it. So I'm not pausing it for that long, but if I want a three or four second pause and just let it sit there in their face, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll add the foam. Awesome. Oh, that, that's, that's great. There's so much great information in there, Matt, like, you know, as far as how we fish them and, and, you know, where the inspiration from these flies came from, uh, plus some really good pro tips. Tons Thank of you. info. We could do this for hours. I feel like <laughs> pick your That's brain. Easy, yeah. it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's super fun. We're so glad that uh, you agreed to do this with us tonight. We we can't tell you, uh, you know, we can't give you a big enough thanks. So yeah. we really Huge appreciate it. If you haven't done so yet, give Matt a follow yeah, on check out. at adaptive fly on Instagram and adaptive fly.com. You should probably buy some flies since he it's winter and he has time to tie for you. So you can have trout stock up. Right That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to switch screens here real quick. Hang on one second here. We're going to add Matt. as a picture in picture. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. A few things before we sign off for the week. Um, give us a follow if you haven't done so yet. Hit that subscribe button so you know when there's new videos coming up. Uh Big announcement. We're doing something new, Brian, and it has something to do with these microphones. Mm, what, what could that what be? What could it be? Is there a podcast in the works, maybe? Yes, we have uh, actually recorded our first podcast. It's crazy. Um, you all talked us into it. Uh, episode one is available. Link in our uh, Instagram bio right now. I'll put it up on the website tomorrow. A little scared. <laughs> but I'm so excited about some of the episodes. We finally get to talk about the Paris Hilton incident that happened this summer. Uh, right. We get to talk about uh, how we, when some of our guys lost their catalytic converter uh, fishing down south, and we had to go rescue them. Uh, lots of good fun stories from the past year, So just and some good fishing knowledge, too. Hopefully, we can get Matt in on one of those and pick his brain some more about musky Absolutely. fishing. Absolutely. I'd yeah. love to have him as a podcast. So next yeah. week, join us, same time, same place, YouTube, live, free, 7.30 p.m., and we'll have Andy Gerard. probably, I, actually, you know what, I guarantee he's going to tie something smaller than this. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> I'm going to bring out my macro lens for this. So, you know, he's uh, a wonderful tire. He's really good. He's uh, He's been a commercial tire for Gates, like Gates and a bunch of other shops, and he is a, a detail machine, which is great absolutely so uh anything else to add Brian? thanks so much for tuning in we appreciate uh, thanks everyone for tuning in especially to matt uh big thanks to him and uh support your local fly shop yeah, yeah that's right yeah yeah buy some materials uh yeah. all that shameless stuff uh all buy some stuff. flies from matt and uh wherever your local shop is try and support them absolutely so, thanks, thanks guys everyone. thanks matt uh yeah, we're no gonna problem. finish this matt stay put for a second and yeah. uh We'll see everyone next week.